All right, it's about time. Ooh, loud. Um, 12.05 on the nose. So, my talk is called War Stories. What I've got up here is a graph of my annoyance with OpenStack over time. <laughs> Not really. So this is actually a graph of search traffic uh, by Google on OpenStack over time. Um, it's been a crazy five years. So war stories. Basically, what does five years in the OpenStack trenches mean? Um, what this is going to be is essentially like a fireside chat. I'm going to tell you some funny moments in the history of OpenStack, some mistakes that we made, some things we did well, um, and tie up at the end with a little bit of ideas about what went wrong, kind of a retrospective and what went right over the past five years. So I think the best place to start, of course, is with me. So my name is Vishwananda Shai. Everybody calls me Vish. Um, based on the name, you can imagine that my background is both in computers and meditation. Um, but I'm not really here to talk much about myself. I'm here to talk about the beginning and the middle and the end. So first things first, 2010. I think it's easiest to tell from my perspective. So I started out here. Who knows which state this, state this is? Raise your hand. Yes. All right. Iowa. We're known for potatoes. Nope, that's Idaho. We're known for corn. So I uh, actually grew up in a little town in southeast Iowa, um, in the middle of what we refer to as Silicon Valley. <laughs> Great little spot, um, doing tech stuff in the Midwest. Uh, back in 2010, I had this interesting opportunity. And the opportunity was to go work, to move to California to go work at NASA. Now, why did I need to go work at NASA? So NASA, it turns out, had a problem. They had 3,000 websites. And all of these websites were running on servers in different locations. Some of them were in data centers owned by NASA. Some of them were in rooms sitting underneath one of the NASA centers. Some of them were in under people's desks. Some of them were with hosting companies. And so some folks at NASA had this great plan, which was, what if we took all of these websites and we united them and put them on a cloud? Now, of course, it's NASA, it's government. They weren't totally comfortable using public cloud, so they had to develop an internal platform as a service. We actually, uh, it was called NASA.net initially. And the goal was to use open source software and create a cloud that could run, uh, be a consistent platform for these 3,000 websites that were run by NASA. Uh, so I'm sure you've seen this, infrastructure service, platform as a service, software as a service. So our goal was to create platform as a service initially, although we never actually got there, funnily enough, um, because in order to build platform, you need the underlying components. You need infrastructure as a service. So the initial focus was to create an infrastructure as a service platform to run uh, NASA websites. And we searched for all the open source software out there. And the biggest one at the time was this thing called Eucalyptus. Um, we actually bought a container. Uh, and we called the cloud NASA Nebula. Um, you'll notice that uh, Cisco and Verari were the, uh, the, the people that helped us get the hardware. Verari doesn't really exist anymore. It's been renamed to something. I can't remember what. But they made Blade servers. Uh, we got this container. And the reason was because uh, the Ames Research Center in uh, Mountain View, California, is right next to May West. Like It has incredible connectivity, but it had no data center space. Um, there were a bunch of extremely inefficient rooms that were being used. It was an old Air Force base, um, horrible heat dispersion, et cetera. So there was no place to stick servers. So essentially what we did was um, buy a container, put a bunch of servers sitting next to the connectivity that we had and plug them in. We put a chiller outside. That's actually a satellite dish that you can see up in the, cor in the corner there. Um, and that was NASA, our cloud. So the next thing that happened is we had this great infrastructure service cloud. We started working on the platform layer. And there was this website. So usaspending.gov, anybody remember this website? It came out like around 2010. Um, and it was one of Obama's big things. He wanted to give transparency into how government money was spent. Now, this website was like the healthcare.gov debacle of five years ago. So it was behind schedule. It was over budget. Um, they had built this huge platform, but they had spent so much money, they had no money left to host it. And so uh, Vivek Kundra, the CTO of the White House, came to us and said, hey, 
I hear you have this cloud. Can we host usaspending.gov on your, on your infrastructure cloud? To which all of the engineers said, no. <laughs> we do not want to be responsible for usaspending.gov going down. You know, this is an alpha quality product, et cetera. But the problem is that you don't really say no to the White House. So very soon, we had people using our internal cloud in that container, running usaspending.gov um, from the team at the White House. So we had actual users. It was great. Um, and we were smart enough to partition that user group off, for, off of our research users so that if uh, there was a failure, it was isolated between the two. Um, and we started building up our alpha cloud. The problem was that once we got to about 40 users, the thing blew up. So there was a bunch of problems in the early days of Eucalyptus. One was that it had an in-memory queue. And if that queue crashed, the entire system would blow up. When, that system, when, when the system would blow up, the, the main controller would blow up, all of the compute nodes would sit there and go, oh, I haven't heard from the controller in a while. I'm going to delete all of my instances that are running. <laughs> so hey, it's a cloud, right? <laughs> totally fine. Not so fine. So um, additionally, the, the other big problem in the early days of Eucalyptus is they had adopted early on this open core model. And so we were trying to submit patches to them. And every time we would submit patches, they would go, oh, you know, we have something like this in the enterprise version of our product. Why don't you just buy that? And we're like, well, we don't have the budget for it. <laughs> so eventually, we had to just completely throw the whole thing out and build something ourselves. The problem is we didn't have permission to do that. So April 9th, 2010 was the day that it happened. And there is one other person in this room that was there on that day, and that's Termi. He's sitting back there. This is not a picture of Termi's house, but it's similar to this. <laughs> um, so basically, we all sat down in, in uh, Termi's house. There were about four of us there locally and four of us remote. Um, and we decided that we were going to create OpenStack, only we didn't call it that at the time. We decided we were going to create a Python-based cloud service that, could, that we could replace Eucalyptus. Um, in the data center. Now, interestingly, this is the day that I showed up in San Francisco. So I, I arrive in the mission. I call up um, Josh at the time. And I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, hacking on stuff? Cool, I'll come over. I come over and said, so today we're going to build cloud software. This weekend, we're going to demo it on Monday. Nice introduction to my first day in San Francisco. And of course, we had Termi over here who types about 75 words a minute plus while coding on a big, loud, clacky keyboard. So I'm sitting there my first day going, what am I doing? I don't even know how this works. And he's like typing out code extremely quickly. So I had to catch up real quick. So we created this thing called Nova. That's not really a Chevy Nova, more like a supernova. And so it was AWS and Python. Four days after we started, we were demoing it to um, the, the civil servants above us at NASA who had not given us permission to create it. So this was all on our own time, open source, created on the side. Then we got permission from the higher ups. And in three weeks, we had moved all of the alpha customers over from uh, Eucalyptus over to Nova. So we were pretty excited, very fast iteration. We did the minimum viable product. We got it working. Um, and everything was great. So we had a cloud. Um, and the first thing we did was we released the code open source because we wanted NASA to be able to use it. And somehow, Thierry, who is also here, found it on the internet. And uh, he was working at Rackspace at the time. Now, Rackspace had just created this initiative to, to basically um, take all of their cloud software. They'd rewritten their object storage software. They called it Swift. And they were about to rewrite their compute software. Um, and they had brought. Uh, Rick and Soren on and a bunch of people from Drizzle to kind of redesign and rebuild their compute software in Python from scratch using a lot of the same principles. So they kind of went, eh, this sort of seems like kind of the same thing. Let's see if we can work together. And together we created OpenStack. So that's the beginning of the story. That was, that was when OpenStack actually became a thing. We had this design summit uh, in Austin. Um, but there's a lot that happened between then and now. <laughs> And some of the moments are quite entertaining. For example, first moment I'm calling lawyered. So <laughs> we had this design summit. And we, the, the idea was we were going to take all of the um, code that we had written at Nova, we had written it in private, then we added some stuff at NASA, and then we were going to release it so that everybody could build it. And we were going to have a demo day on, I think, the Thursday of the, the first design summit. Unfortunately, we didn't actually have permission from NASA legal to release the code yet. 
So 10 p.m. the night before the build and run Nova demo that we were all doing the next day, getting all the, the uh, coders involved, we finally got permission to a number of very heated phone calls between Chris Kemp and the legal department and William S. Sock and various people there. And the way that they ended up doing it is they forced us to, they said, okay, if you want to do this, you have to assign copyright to NASA because NASA can't create, the government can't create copyright. So we had to assign the copyright to the government so that they could open source it. And that was the only way we could get through the legal process. So this is the day before going through the entire code base, cleaning out all of the initial copyright and reassigning it over to the US government so that we could actually release this thing and do a demo out of it. That's Jesse Andrews, by the way, who was involved very early on at OpenStack in this little company called Anso Labs. Um, Anso Labs was the consulting company where we did all, uh, this is Jesse and Sue, the two founders of the company, we did all of the work for NASA on OpenStack through a consulting company because government's complicated. Contracting is hard, so becoming a civil servant is years of work, so we all were under this contracting company. There's one very interesting moment that happened here. about. A few months after OpenStack was created, we kind of went, you know what, this looks like it's gonna be a thing. Like it's growing really fast, people might be interested. Maybe we could do consulting not just for NASA, but for other companies. So why don't we, instead of just all being independent contractors, why don't we actually turn this into more of a bit consulting business and all become employees? Now here lies the problem. Some of you may, may remember the beard of OpenStack, uh, Todd Wiley. Um, Todd and I were two of the original people that worked on the code at NASA. Um, he decided to become an employee before I did of Ansel Labs, but I signed the paperwork first. So of course we had to have a battle to decide who was employee number one. Um, and being tech people as we were, we had two different competitions. One was rock, paper, scissors, Spock, lizard, which is quite entertaining. And the other one is something uh, that's called uh, rock, paper, anything. Now, Rock, Paper, Anything is, an, op is a, an improv game where basically you can do anything instead of rock, paper, or scissors, and then the audience decides who wins. And I'm happy to say that I won the battle. The Rock, Paper, Anything was the last battle, and I won it. The thing that I was in Rock, Paper, Anything was Todd's beard, so I actually beat him with his own beard. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> so I became employee number one of Enso Labs. Um, Enso Labs later uh, joined up with Rackspace, so we got bought by Rackspace. Um, which I'll we'll get to in a bit. So what were some of the early challenges that we had to deal with? Um, probably the most interesting one right off the bat was we had to integrate a Zen hypervisor. So OpenStack initially was only KVM, um, and Rackspace really had a lot of investment in Zen, so they wanted to use Zen as the hypervisor. So we had to abstract the back end significantly so that we could support multiple hypervisors. Um, that was a challenge. It, it didn't take a huge amount of time initially, but I feel like it's cost us a lot over time to, be, uh, to have done this. And I'll explain the trade-offs later when I get to the retrospective part. The next thing was we had this whole other code base out there called Swift. And Swift had made a couple of design decisions that were a little bit different from ours. And we were trying to create a unified product of some sort. And so we actually, one of the big things that Swift had done is all of their asynchronous program was some, done using Eventlet. We were using Twisted in, in Nova. And so we decided, let's unite. Let's use the same libraries and same frameworks, because asynchronous programming is tricky, and we can benefit of using the same expertise. So that involved rewriting another big component of Nova early on uh, to make it uh, work properly with, uh, with the Eventlet code base. The next really entertaining thing was the API. So we had initially just a clone of the AWS APIs. Rackspace was like, hey, we should create a new shared open set of APIs that are called the OpenStack APIs. They were initially based, the version one of the OpenStack APIs was essentially a clone of the Rackspace API, which we then iterated on. And of course, the Rackspace API supported XML in addition to JSON. Um, which sparked a whole bunch of debate because people did not like supporting both. And there was one very famous quote by Jay Pipes during, uh, I think, the second summit, um, which was, get your dirty XML out of my JSON. So we were opinionated. We, <laughs> there were things that we believed in, and we made compromises and trade-offs throughout the whole life of OpenStack. I mean, that's, that's what being a community is. You, you start with one thing, you debate it, and you, and you make compromises, and you try and do the best you can. The next, big, the next big challenge was BZR versus Git. So a bunch of the principles we inherited from Ubuntu, like the time-based releases, the development process. And so initially, we were using Launchpad and BZR for everything. Um, and a bunch of the developers who were used to Git and also GitHub were very frustrated with the BZR workflow because it just was a little bit slow. And it just didn't look as pretty in some respects. Um, unfortunately, we really liked the project management features that we got on Launchpad for bug tracking and um, merging of code and stuff like that. And so for a long time, we were kind of stymied. We couldn't move over to Git because we needed to use those code bases until 
um, Monty, and I think Jim was involved in this, after a while finally said, okay, we're going to move everything over to Garrett. We did this explanation. We managed to move everything from BZR to Git. So those of you who work on the code base today are happily able to use Git all the time and go through the fun code reviews on Garrett, which I'm sure we all really appreciate. The next really interesting part of the story, so this is after Ansel Labs joined Rackspace, was PTLs. So initially there weren't any PTLs. In fact, there wasn't a technical committee. It was called the Project Policy Board. Um, but we needed a way, and unfortunately, I'm sorry to all of you who have been PTLs and we be, will be PTLs, the PTLs are my fault. So one day at Rackspace, I was sitting with uh, a few of the people, I think it was Mark, uh, Mark wasn't there yet, so it was probably John Purrier, uh, Jim Curry, some of the original higher ups at Rackspace, and I said, you know what, the thing that we need is we need, for, to make some of these te technical decisions, we need a kind of single point of contact. We need someone to go talk to, you know, if, another pro if one project needs to get something from another project, there's gotta be one person there. They could be like the tech lead for the, for the system, you know, and it would be really great to have one of these things. Now, when I suggested it, I had no desire to do this. I was actually um, hoping Jesse was gonna come in and, and be the first PTL for Nova. Um, and basically, as soon as I suggested, everybody said, oh, that sounds great, you should totally do that. No, wait a second, no. <laughs> you, missed, you missed what I was going for here. <laughs> I didn't want to be this person. I wanted someone else to do it. And unfortunately, uh, I did become the first PTL for Nova, which was uh, quite a lot of work and more than I expected at the time. Um, so next round of startups happened a little bit after that. Um, we had a couple of them, both founded by people that were originally at NASA. So um, Piston started, Josh and Gretchen were both from NASA, Chris was from Rackspace. Um, at the same time, or similar time, Nebula started, which was Devin and Chris who were both at NASA as well. So we had a lot of this sort of NASA-based old group kind of going in these new directions of trying to turn OpenStack into a product and sell it. So that was kind of cool. So the next really interesting state thing that happened was Keystone. So initially, OpenStack didn't have any identity outside of the AWS um, Access and Secret, which was embedded in Nova. So we needed a generic identity framework that all the services could talk to. And so we decided to build this thing called Keystone. And it was loosely modeled on the Rackspace uh, identity uh, API with a, a few changes. Um, and unfortunately, the, the people that wrote it um, were all had written the Java implementation, and so they put in a lot of different layers of abstraction. It was very unpythonic, and after about three or four months, it was just a total mess. Like, you couldn't add any code to it because you had to write it in six different places. So we got this crazy idea to create this thing called Keystone Lite. Um, and uh, Termi essentially wrote this by himself. I'm sure he was uh, at least two drinks deep for most of it. <laughs> um, basically rewrote the whole thing in a pythonic manner, um, so that we actually had a way to um, build it along the OpenStack principles a little bit more easily. Um, and we managed to replace the entire code base. We had essentially one commit that replaced the entire old code base with a new code base. So we had to have testing um, to ensure that we didn't break between the versions. And it was one of the great pr uh, switcheroos that we pulled throughout OpenStack. And it took a, a lot of work on both the coding side and the, the out community outreach side to get people to buy into that this was needed. And then, of course, Termi passed off the, uh, the mantle of Keystone to Joe Heck, and since then it's gone to Morgan Feinberg, and I think there was someone else in between who I'm forgetting. But yes, Dolph, right, Dolph, who was a great uh, early developer from Rackspace working on, on the code base. So that I th consider a great success. When we actually managed to get the Keystone switched over to a better implementation, um, kind of under the surface, without everybody completely losing their minds. I don't think it's something we could actually do today, because <laughs> there's a lot more code and there's a lot more people involved. Um, soon after that, I realized that one of the problems with being a PTL is that you don't have enough time to do anything else. Um, I was doing deployments with Rackspace, and I actually went to Paris to help um, uh, Eno Vance do a deployment um, in, uh, in France. And at the same time, we were r ratcheting up to do the belief, the, the release right before the Essex summit. So I think it was the, the Folsom release, perhaps. Um, and so I was doing a full day of work doing deployment and then coming back to my hotel room and I was five hours or eight hours offset from the US. And so I basically do a full day of work back home merging patches. I think I was doing a rate of about 30 reviews a day at that point. And then um, 
Immediately after two weeks of doing that, working like 16 hour days, I flew back and the design su summit started the day after I arrived. So I got like four hours of sleep and then was there for the whole design summit. After that three week period, I realized that I couldn't do PTL duties and another job. Like it's a full time job, which is good. It showed that OpenStack had grown to the point where it needed someone doing that full time. And so I have, of course, a whole lot of respect for everyone who has currently um, become a PTL and is working on things. Uh, the next step in the OpenStack evolution was we realized that the teams were having trouble scaling. Nova had gotten up to about 60 or 70 developers at this point, and it just was very hard to manage that many people across so many companies, which is another thing I'll get back to in the retrospective. So we decided to create this thing called Cinder. We, we actually forklifted all of the volume-related code from Nova into a new project that replicated the same APIs, and um, it was interchangeable. So you could, from one release, be running Nova Volume, and the next release running Cinder, and you wouldn't know the difference. And then we iterated from there. It was actually our most successful breakout of a project that we've had so far. It worked out really well. Um, John Griffith was highly instrumental in doing that. He was the original PTL. And now, of course, as you all know, Skrillex. <laughs> <laughs> is the new PTL, Mike Perez. Um, and about this time, so we were getting kind of beat up in the press throughout this whole period because Rackspace essentially was the main one running the show. And people were like, is it really an open source project if there's one company behind it running everything and they're, they're in control? And we felt like it was causing a lot of other companies not, want, not wanting to be involved. And so the next thing that we did was we created the foundation. Nope, not that, that nope. There we go, the foundation. Um, and this has been something that had been working for a while, been worked on for a while, and I think it's been another great success of OpenStack. Although, interestingly, it didn't make the press any happier because now they're complaining there's too many people involved and there's no clear direction because one company isn't running it. So, of course, the press changes their mind at all times. So, after about two years of being OpenStack uh, Nova PTL, I finally decided that I had enough, two years worth of cat herding was enough for me, and I decided to pass the torch on, so um, pass the torch to Russell. And I think we've gotten in a pretty nice cadence now with the different projects where, to prevent burnout, people do it for a year or two and then, and then move on and let someone else take over. So Russell passed it on to Michael Still, and Michael Still has now passed it on to John Garbutt. So we have, we have a nice kind of rotation going through different companies and different, different experts so that each person can kind of bring in their own expertise to the project. So that's working out quite well. And then, of course, came the grand project explosion of 2013, <laughs> where essentially every company wanted to get involved because now we had this uh, wonderful uh, you know, foundation. Everybody could be involved. But it was very hard to contribute to existing projects. You need a lot of existing knowledge. And sometimes the team was so big, the review queues were long. And so every company said, well, I'll make a new project. So we had about 10 or 15 projects show up in the space of a few months. In fact, at one point I joked that what I should do is create a form letter for declaring a new project on the mailing list that people could use so that, you know, just insert name here, insert, you know, title here, uh, and goals here. Because we really, I think, went a little bit overboard in terms of the number of new projects we were creating. I mean, it was great, everybody was excited, but it me meant that suddenly it was very hard to manage it from all the shared summits became more difficult, how we ran things on the TC to bring projects into OpenStack became more difficult, and so we had to adapt. Um, and ultimately, um, right in the middle of this addition to, of all of the new projects, um, OpenStack started to move from dev tests in a lot of environments into production. So once we hit about um, Grizzly, Havana, Icehouse, that's when people started saying, okay, I've been testing this for a while, I think I'm gonna put it in production now. And we did some things in the code base to really help with that. So for example, in Nova, we made upgrades a little bit easier. Um, but overall, it's people had enough familiarity that the APIs were stable enough that they're like, okay, we're gonna actually start sticking this in production workloads, which is why we had a huge uptick around then in, in searches and people getting interested in OpenStack, because it's people are actually starting to use it now um, for real workloads. And then, unfortunately, <laughs> We had the Great Neutron debacle. Um, if you don't, aren't familiar with the Great Neutron debacle, this t-shirt from, uh, from the last summit, I think, kind of sums it up. Um, or it might have been two summits ago. So uh, 
so the issue was initially all the networking code was in Nova Network. And instead of kind of forklifting that code out like we did with Cinder, we had a bunch of people come in and write a more SDN focused from scratch networking implementation that supported a whole bunch of features, but unfortunately didn't map perfectly to the features that were in Nova Network. And so the main problem was that people had a huge amount of difficulty migrating. And people are still dealing with this, with this today. Um, the newer installs are OK, because almost everybody who installs now is starting out with Neutron, so they don't have to go through this migration. But there's a bunch of legacy installs that are going through the pain of how do I make the transition, keep my performance, keep my, my feature set. Um, and that, that's something that's still making a lot of consultants money, I'm sure. Um, but we realized in, in this process so that the best thing that we can do community-wise is to be inclusive of everyone. So if new companies want to come in and create new projects, we need to find a way for them to be a part of OpenStack without um, necessarily causing a burden on the other projects and, and finding a way for them to contribute and fi fulfill their company guidelines, et cetera. Um, so over the past six months to a year, we've been working on this thing that we call the Big Tent. Um, and the Big Tent is essentially finding a way to include more people. And it's, it's, a, it's a subtle change in that the focus of OpenStack is about the people as opposed to about the projects. And so when you're saying OpenStack is about the people, you can be really inclusive. When you're saying it's about the projects, then you have to declare whether a project is good enough to be part of OpenStack, which is not something that anybody really wants to be involved in um, from a community perspective. Um, so that was one of the great successes, actually finally pushing that through. It took about, it's taken about a year and a half working on the TC in, in discussions, trying to get this to happen. And that brings us to 2015, where you know, we have the biggest summit ever again. <laughs> Finally might break that next year in Hong Kong, because I don't think the venue's big enough to hold more than this one has. And we're working on Liberty, which I think is kind of a fitting name, Freedom, for uh, the, next, the next release. So what, what can we learn? What, what do we do wrong throughout this development process, throughout the community building process? What were the mistakes that we made that held us back? And what were some of the things we did right? So, First of all, things we did well. I think from the beginning, we had a pretty clear vision that people could buy into that un understand about what we were trying to build, that we wanted to build cloud software, right? Um, we had a great um, marketing presence, and that, I think, ties in well with the clear vision. Most of the people that in got involved with OpenStack early were not because the code was stellar. It didn't do much at first. I mean, I told you, we wrote it in a weekend, right? Within three weeks, we were announcing it, right? So it's, it's not like there was a lot there initially, but people loved the idea of collaborating on something that could be running all of the infrastructure of the future. That was a pretty powerful idea. So people got involved because of the idea and because of the vision. Our marketing presence was excellent. Like the, the people at Rackspace and later at the foundation that were responsible for marketing really did a good job of playing up that story and making it accessible to everyone and getting everyone involved. The CR framework was built, that we built was, is awesome. I mean, there's no way that we could be at the scale that we are at without that being there. Um, once we got about 50 developers, like up till then, you can kind of do whatever you want. Once you're over 50, you really need some things in place to actually automate a lot of the testing and, and, and merging uh, process. And so that actually works quite well. We run into problems. It's slow sometimes. Reviews take a while. But, but we did a good job in terms of the back end of making those tests run. And I think we did the best we, thing we did was how we built the community. So all of you guys are here, guys and gals are here, because we have inspired the community to come and participate, doing open development, doing design summits, doing everything on the mailing list, using Blueprints and Garrett, all of these things that allow everyone to come in and participate and be a part of the idea of OpenStack is really powerful. OK, so where, have, where do we fall short? Um, these are personal opinions. Um, I think one of the earliest mistakes we made is we made it way too pluggable. So it's, it's always a tough trade off because you want to be inclusive. You want everybody in the community to participate, which means you want to solve every use case. But the problem is, if you solve every use case, you don't do anything well. And we early on started adding too many APIs, too many backends, too many points of, of integration and pluggability, 600 different configuration options in Nova, really? I'm responsible for almost all of those, though, by the way. Um, so that was, that was a mistake. Um, I think if we knew where OpenStack was going today, we probably would have picked a different language to write it in. So it turns out scripting languages are really good for small scale projects that are probably under 100,000 lines of code and have smallish development teams working on them. And you get a huge advantage from the agility you get from being able to code stuff and prototype stuff very quickly. The problem is that once you get over a certain size, um, 
it actually gets in your way to be in a dynamically typed language that the compiler isn't helping you out on, on stuff. You end up, I've had many times where I spent three times the amount of time fixing the tests that were written um, that I did actually writing the code to solve a problem. And so if, if we knew that it was gonna be at the scale that we're at today with a number of different people trying to be involved, I think we could have made some different choices around tooling and languages. Um, but we didn't know, and we wanted to do, and we wanted to build fast, and, and that's what happens. And it's not something that necessarily uh, dooms the projects. It just is something that causes a little bit of slowdown, especially at the size that we are today. Um, the other, another big problem is that, which is still being discussed, is there hasn't been a very strong product focus in OpenStack. We built a toolkit. We built a framework. Um, and we built that because we have all these different companies, each with their own agendas, and they all need a way to either make money or, or succeed with OpenStack, solve business problems with OpenStack. So we needed to support all of those different configuration options. But it means that there isn't a clear product. And a lot of these companies have, start, have startups and companies have come about because they're trying to kind of opinionate OpenStack into a clear product. Um, and having spent the past few years at a company trying to selling that and not necessarily succeeding, it's, it's difficult to pick a product that actually meets all of the requirements that people are trying to get out of OpenStack. So it's actually a hard problem, but I feel like we could have done it better than we did. We could have at least, we could have picked a smaller set of things to work on and said, this is what we're gonna do and only this, and then moved into other verticals and areas later. Uh, and the final thing that's been a big challenge for us is we, d we haven't figured out how to do team scaling yet. Once we get over about 20 people on a team, it starts getting pretty messy. Um, code base gets too long, the review queue gets too long, and essentially the only solution we've come up with so far is, okay, let's take this project and split it up into smaller projects, which eases the burden a bit, but it seems like there must be a better way for us to learn how to collaborate and work together in larger teams that's successful. And some of that might be tooling, some of that may be better communication. I don't, I don't have the answers for what we need there, but that's definitely a place um, that we could use some better choices. So I think that's the end of my talk, unless anybody has any questions, because I've got, I think, 10 minutes left? Yeah, over here. Ah, it's a tough question. Um, so the question was, what language would I use if we were to start over? I think probably Java, which is going to scare a lot of people, because it's not very open source friendly. On the other hand, the libraries in it work. It's statically typed, and people know how to build large pieces of software in it. So it's got a lot, a long track record of doing that. Of course, personally, I would love to build it in something new like Go or Rust, but I think you're going to run into some of the problems you ran into Python there where you don't have, a, you don't have good libraries. You're just... You're kind of having to build a lot of stuff from scratch because they're not fully developed yet. There's a microphone at the back here we could use because we're recording, please. Sure. Is there, do you want to go to the mic or I can just repeat your question? Go ahead. What's going to happen in the next five years? Oh man, I don't do predictions. <laughs> so the question is what happens in the next five years? Um, I don't know. Uh, there's, there's obviously a lot of trends happening around this space that are, that are interesting. I, I will make one question mark prediction. Um, and and there's, there's an assumption that people have made that private cloud is a useful thing. And I'm starting to question that. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, private clouds actually kind of, I mean, I'm sure there'll be some here and there, but they actually start dissipating and more people and more and more people go to public clouds. Because I think people are starting to become more comfortable with the security of public clouds. And the real IT savings comes in when you actually don't have to manage your own data center. Or you can offload a lot of that data center management to someone who's doing it at a larger scale. So it'll be interesting, but I, um, I definitely saw selling private clouds is a challenging bit of work. And I mean, we had some sales cycles at Nebula that were over a year. And um, I think part of the reason is it's not necessarily solving a real problem that people have as it, as it is today. Now, if it moves into sort of more private platform as a service, like solving the original problem that we had at NASA, which is how do we get all these 3,000 websites onto the same framework, that might be something that's, that, that exists in, in business. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see the trends going more towards public cloud in the future. Um, so that's, that's the one opinionated view of where we might be going over the next five years. But it's really hard to say. I mean, there's new projects. There's people are getting super excited about containers, and the, everybody wonders how they're going to fit in. Um, what's that? Yeah, everything's going to be containers. 
Quoting Rafi. <laughs> okay, one more question. Who's got one? Okay, two more. Here. So the question is, um, there seems to be a disconnect between business goals and the marketing focus of OpenStack. And, there, and uh, I think that's something that, we, that is being addressed. Like there's a lot more product development communication happening. In fact, there's a talk this afternoon about product management getting together and figuring out what are the actual problems and how do we communicate to the developers. You know, no one's really done an open, stack, an open source project in this manner before. So we're kind of figuring a lot of things out about how you manage a team of 500 developers all working for different companies with different goals, right? Um, I, I think it's getting better. One of the main problems historically in our marketing focus is our marketing has been totally directed towards operators and developers, which developers, in the sense of developers that are going to work on OpenStack instead of use OpenStack. And one of the things that um, there's kind of this movement happening now of focusing on end users and people trying to use OpenStack and that being a valuable thing to focus on from a marketing perspective, which is great for all the companies trying to sell OpenStack, for sure. Um, so I think those things are becoming more aligned over time, uh, but we'll just have to see. Yeah, up here. What's OpenStack stand on Amazon Web Services? Hmm. Uh, I don't know if we have one. <laughs> they are a cloud. Um, I, what, do you have more? <laughs> so, I mean, it would be great. Amazon is welcome to join the community at any point, and, I, and we've always been happy to let them. <laughs> yeah, but it hasn't happened yet. Okay, one more back here. In the very beginning, why did we choose open source? Um, so initially, obviously, we weren't trying to build open source, but we were trying to do it on the cheap um, at NASA. So we, it wasn't a program that had any budget initially. So NASA Net was an idea with no budget. Now, if you're familiar with government contracting, often it works that you have an idea and you pull budget from various places and kind of make it happen. I don't know where the money from the contain, for the container actually came from. Um, it's probably for some rocket at Lockheed Martin. Who knows? Um, <laughs> so. Oh. <laughs> IT contract, there you go. It was under, the, yes, it was under the NASA Ames IT contract as a subheading somewhere. So um, we didn't have a lot of money, which is why we couldn't go buy an open source, pro a, a commercial product or, or pay for a open core open source project because we needed to do it cheap. Um, and so it, we had hoped that the existing open source solutions out there would solve the problems and they just didn't. Yeah. It wasn't really, no, it was, it was budgeting, that's it. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. I hope I provided some entertainment for you.